Hi, good evening. How are you guys doing? Perfect, Everybody thank good? You. Hello. Yeah. Well, I'm so Hi, glad Peter. that you could make it today and that we're all here. So um, let's first do a really quick round of introductions and we're going to be super sparse. Just say who you are, who you work for, and we'll move along, okay? Because we've only got 20 minutes. Um, and, oh, you know what? Could I get you all to put, you know, oh, there we go. Satish, could you start? Sure. Thanks, Denise, for hosting this uh, talk. Um, I work for PayPal and I live in Chennai in India. Um, I lead uh, PayPal's uh, entry into the, our growth markets or expansion into our growth markets. And um, we have a team of engineers here in India who work very closely with our global counterparts in order to make this happen uh, in terms of launching new products and capabilities of PayPal into these growth markets. Thank you again for that's this. fabulous. Thank you. Okay, um, Arthur. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Arthur Maltzen. I work for Capital One. Uh, I'm here in the Toronto, Canada office. So we just had some snow recently. And well, that's Canada. Um, I work in a, a kind of horizontal tech division that builds tooling to empower developers to own and operate their own infrastructure in dev QA and production all in the cloud. And uh, I actually got started on inner source thanks to Roderick, who actually hired me <laughs> for the team. So. That's great. Thank you so much. All right, Roderick, you, that was your intro. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining this talk. Uh, I'm Roderick Randolph. I am a distinguished engineer at Capital One. I also work with Arthur um, as part of a horizontal team across the enterprise um, and the inner source. Um, product that we um, oversee is, is a CI CD framework that enables teams to ship software uh, basically to production in an automated fashion. Yeah, that's been such a fruitful place for InnerSource to show up in company. So that's great that you have that story. We'll look for that. And then Matt? Thank you. Um, I'm Matt Cobby. I work for National Australia Bank and I'm in very sunny Melbourne at the moment where we've got 30 degrees uh, afternoon. I work for the uh, NAB Cloud Guild where I'm a uh, manager and we are responsible for training our engineers on cloud and our engineering foundations. And we've kind of come to in the source through that aspect of cultural change. That's fabulous. And I am Denise Cooper. Um, I'm founder of the InnerSource Commons and former PayPal employee, which is how I know Satish, a uh, customer of Capital One. And I, I'm sorry, I can't help you, Australia, but um, <laughs> I am sitting in my car in the middle of California right this minute. So um, we do this wherever we are when it's time to do it. Um, so great. Uh, I understand that you guys have been sharing practices and you've really come up with a nice set of practices that are working for you. So um, let's dive right into that. Who wants to introduce the first practice? Um, I have it to go first. Yes. Um, That's great, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, what we find, um, what we obviously been working for a bank, uh, banks that are typically very uh, regulated environments and very difficult to introduce change to. So one of the things, the best practice we did was um, we referred to, we read the inner source commons, the patterns through and through, and we decided mm -hmm. to look at those and work out how can we make these much more uh, easy to, well, not easy to understand, but more consumable for our stakeholders internally. And so we built an operating model internally inside the bank. And this operating model fitted into the bank culture very well in terms of it had a governance layer on it, it had contributions to it, it had an engagement model between teams in it. And we, it was a very contained piece of work highlighting the best parts of the source commons. We then took their executives through this and we took our leadership through this to get their feedback on it. And we found that by getting their endorsement for this, it became a very easy way to get the concept of inner source out through the bank. Um, inner source was initially very much uh, kind of con thought about in the same way as open source and open source generally within banks has a, a slight element of do we trust open source do we not trust open source so by wrapping up the concepts of ways of working with um, inner source into this framework of a of a governance model we found that it was very easy to get it uh, adopted within the bank um, and in there we said we encapsulated all the different aspects of documentations and the contributing mds and the readme aspects as well 
and really, really helped accelerate and uh, get that adoption across many different teams. That is a really, really great story. I love that. I love the idea of using a, an internal roadshow um, to sort of evangelize for you and build, build uh, consensus or at least momentum in the right direction. So that's fabulous. Thank you so much. I love that. Who wants to go next? can go next. Great, uh, Satish. Yeah, that is, I owe you a fair share of gratitude for introducing inner sourcing uh, to me about five years ago when we were at PayPal. Um, my team was looking at building a, a market entry to a new market and the PayPal obviously has uh, over 3000 components uh, of code lying around that is helping customers move money. Um, so in order to be able to provide a market centric experience, uh, our need at that time was to ensure that every single aspect or capability that we need to offer to the customer needs to be customized and built for a certain market. Right? So we had to right from the time when a customer onboards to PayPal to the time they are able to do transactions, to the time they're able to, we are able to service them and post transaction experiences, everything needs to be built out. And obviously this is a, PayPal as a company has several teams. How do you, as one smaller team, get into this vast piece of code and do changes that are customizable for your own team's needs? Was the problem statement we had and we were grappling with when uh, Denise introduced us to inner sourcing. So what uh, we have found out, the, the first and foremost process of inner sourcing um, is actually the mindset of collaboration. It's not even a process, it's actually a mindset of collaboration that has uh, taken us so far for the past five years, we have been inner sourcing into different teams. Um, collaboration also is not just within engineering teams. If you start inner sourcing as a conversation within your company with just engineering as a focus, uh, it, will, it will only go that, uh, that far, right? So in order to make inner sourcing a successful process, what we have found is it, is it is a collaboration between product owners. It is a collaboration between user experience designers, content designers. It's a collaboration between market facing teams like sales teams. It's a collaboration yeah. between engineers, testers. All the teams need to be collaborating together in order to make this a successful process. Otherwise, there will be a lot of friction when you actually get into the implementation. That's the first best practice I would like to share. Yeah, I remember you going through that and you got your team worked extra hard to build those bridges. So that, you know, it sounds like Matt's way of doing it was was um, to go executive by executive or team by team. And, and the way that we did it or you did it in PayPal was just brute force niceness, <laughs> which I think is amazing. Okay, how about Capital One? You guys got one? Yes, yeah, so let me give a little bit of a backstory on our kind of inner sourcing journey. So we, um, we actually, so going back to like 2015, Capital One was on this huge tech transformation. Um, we were moving to the cloud, we were, you know, adopting agile DevOps practices, etc. And um, as we started on this journey, we realized that developers needed to learn a bunch of new tools, processes, and, and, and connections on just getting software out the door. And um, I actually took a trip, or I actually moved to Toronto. I'm actually back in Virginia now, but I actually took a trip to Toronto. And um, we started a small team, and we, we, needed, we needed a pipeline. We needed to build ship software to production for our business. And uh, we saw that this was a common problem across other parts of the Canada business. And so we, we started to build a framework that enabled teams to ship software quickly. And um, quickly, we soon realized that across the rest of the company that other teams were doing the exact same thing. They were, they were starting to mm -hmm. build similar pipeline frameworks. And so uh, kind of, you know, long story short, we, you know, our inner sourcing journey started kind of small and then organically started to grow to inter enterprise scale. And what's interesting about that is like, we, we were, we were learning a lot, you know, uh, you know, we were, we were hitting a bunch of, uh, we, we were on a learning, this, the, the um, steep learning curve, if you, if you will, because <laughs> we we're moving so quickly. 
Um, we were used to like building software right over each other's shoulder, like literally um, uh, like keyboards to keyboard. And that model didn't work at scale. And so right. uh, we needed to help developers not only learn how to use a framework, but also how to contribute to the framework. And so we, one of the best practices, one of the things that we learned from that experience was we actually needed to pr provide a little bit of white glove service and support initially mm -hmm. to enable them to, to get started. Um, and that started with mobbing sessions, boot camps, training sessions, and uh, as well as ramping up our support, um, support capability and capacity so that we could actually have office hours, Slack channels, right? It was literally, we were starting from ground zero and, and, and moving fairly quickly. Um, so literally in order for our inner source product to, to scale, you really need to start off kind of providing that white glove service. And then as you move, uh, you know, to a larger scale for the entire enterprise, you know, establishing some of those boot camp. And, and training sessions will be really important. And then even further out to encourage people to contribute a little bit of that, that trusted contributor model, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later. That's great. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great story. And um, I, I will tell you that at PayPal, we actually hand trained um, most of the engineers initially uh, and every new engineer that came through as a intern or a new hire recent college grad, we put them through a boot camp that included um, inner source training. It was much harder to get at the older engineers than it was at the new crop that was coming in. Because so. they're, mold they're moldable, right? So Well, but they also have an expectation of both transparency and agency right. that is not normal right. for traditional engineering. So if you want those people to land and thrive in your company, you kind of have to do inner source just to right. figure out how to make it attractive for them. Okay, right. So Arthur, do you have one as well? Yeah, so kind of building up on Roderick's story, I think um, one of the key successes that we've seen for inner source projects, not just the ones that we kind of worked on, but also other inner source products across Capital One that have gained traction, is really investing in the inner source products that scratch your own itch. Right. And, you know, open source kind of started that way, right? Uh, oh, I really, this is really annoying. I'm going to write a tool to make this easier. And then a whole bunch of other people say, you know what? I also found that annoying. I'm going to use your tool. And then they collaborate. Right. So a very similar ethos exists in enterprises. And especially in enterprises that are large, you know, we have uh, so many different compliance requirements and rules and whenever a developer takes the time to automate that really one small pain point and other people start to gravitate to it, that's, that's your opportunity to say, yes, I'm gonna invest in that inner source product, uh, help that team mm -hmm. grow and scale. So that, that, that's what we found early on is a good indicator of a potentially successful inner source product. Yeah, I think that's really true. And as I said at the top, CICD has lately been the number one driver because everybody's having to do it from scratch. And so it's a perfect time to try for code reuse. And um, companies want a consistent implementation, but they don't necessarily, they also want each of the teams to feel a little bit of connection to the project and ownership. And so you know, right. figuring out how to walk that line is, is a very, uh, both useful and, and, you know, interesting entry point. So congratulations on that, both of you. Okay, let's go on now <laughs> to do the second round of really interesting points you guys have all come up with. Um, so this time, I think uh, we'll start with Matt. Um, again, Matt, tell me what you got. Um, thank you. I think one of our best practices we've found uh, along the journey is one around recognition. Um, you know, we've talked previously about our, you know, our encapsulating everything as an operating model, the top-down approach. But our inner source journey very much started as a grassroots approach. Uh, we, I think, have some of the stories. Um, we were doing, we were building some training for our engineers on, uh, on cloud, and we were looking around for a tool to do a particular aspect. And in our bank, we found about 20 different versions of the same tool. Uh, 
all built right. different levels of quality and documentation and it's like okay this there must be a better way we must be a better way to this and that, this is what led us down to inner source and sharing our, our docker images and you know all part of our nab engineering foundations and then sharing the tools but it was it started because people um, wanted to contribute they, they were passionate about the work they were motivated and i feel that we, we tapped into something here very much it's uh, aligned with a uh, um is it Dan Pink's drive, the autonomy, uh, mastery, and purpose, and mm -hmm. people finding that they were, they were contributing because they, they enjoyed contributing. It helped them improve their craft, right. and they got value realization. So for us, our other best practice is very much in recognition. It's recognizing those contributions from people. Um, it's running metrics and reporting across our inner source repositories, so we can see where those contributions come from. And when somebody new joins, uh, we, we celebrate them. Um, we generally always celebrate success, and we're very good mm -hmm. at calling out people's names individually. You know, say you know the top contributor of you know of this season is here. Um, and we will also organize things like hackathons around inner source. Like when can we do a series of contributions along a theme perhaps we'll take one of our engineering components and say we would like to develop these new features on our pipeline so we run a you know a couple of week hackathon on what contributions we can do there we gamify some of this with people and teams at the end of it we award you know we give virtual awards and send swags out to people i think that all helps build very much that sense of community and people talking together and get some buying into it again and I think probably most importantly in terms of scale, it also enables us to, for the, the those um, contributors to then sell it to their teams and they, they, they convince those other people to come on board to inner source and they sell it to others. And that's, I think for us, the key to scale, that peer to peer aspect. Yeah, that's a really important one. And I'm really glad that you're calling it out. Um, open source is based on enlightened self-interest. It's not altruistic. It's very straightforward. If the mm -hmm. practitioners are, experiencing pleasure or getting what they need out of contributing, then they'll keep doing it and they'll tell their friends. And that works inside of companies as well. And you, you get, you, you experience pushback initially, but that's easy to overcome if you've got just a few engineers who can't help but talk about how happy it makes them. So yeah. that's a, that's a great one. Roderick. Yeah. If I could pile on to that, just a couple of points. Um, in our journey to adopting InnerSource, we also found like, like the volume of PRs and issues that come, like if your project, your product is successful, you will have a, a slew of issues and PRs that you can't keep up with. And so right. having that recognition uh, program is really important to enable you to get through that backlog of things that you just have, you don't have the capacity to do. And then the other thing that I will, I will kind of, um highlight is like an open source right if you if you contribute it's almost a self-satisfaction inner sourcing is true as well but you also have you know you have managers you have people who who uh like there's a little bit more politics right involved in inner sourcing and so but just sending a simple hey thank you for your contribution goes a long way in terms of helping that person who contribute to feel really good about themselves and their performance right to the to the manager so just wanted yeah, to I, add on, on to that that's definitely true and in fact at paypal we were experimenting for a while with advertising people's successes in inner source through an alternative hr vehicle you know how every mm. company has the thing with your picture and it says who you work for and everybody in the company can find you that way but it's yeah. made by HR and it's really sterile and it's not really about you and it's your badge <laughs> picture. So it's the worst picture in the world. <laughs> so we were trying to get an alternative, let's say PayPalpedia, that would be wiki based and people could go in and change their thing and add more information about themselves. Mm. And then they could collect badges of the cool shit that they were getting done in InnerSource. Um, nice. Unfortunately, the, none of this got implemented before I left. Left, but I still think this would be super cool. And there have been companies that um, have gamified, especially uh, 360 contributions. So it's easy enough to get somebody who mm -hmm. needs to get a change into a silo to contribute it and deal with the, you know, the feedback and until it's mergeable. It's a lot harder to get those people that are guardians of the silo to look outside their silo and work on other people's code. 
So right. finding ways to make that cool. And, um, you know, several companies have come up with marketplaces of low hanging fruit and intrinsic reward tied to that or extrinsic reward tied to that. So, um, but yeah, praise is absolutely I like that. important. Arthur? I like that uh, expanded profile that you were saying. If you have GitHub, uh, if you use GitHub or GitHub Enterprise, they have that new or semi new profile feature where you can right. have like a full markdown doc about yourself. And yeah, if you share those badges, they could highlight them there. I like it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, it would be e easier and easier to get that done. But you still have to get around right. your HR people. Yes. So. <laughs> that is, I think we've gone far, I mean, not farther than that, hopefully in the last few years. Maybe I've been doing this in terms of assigning some sort of karma points, right? Uh, the other, like, uh, like uh, we were talking about earlier, the flurry of requests that come in is actually sometimes very, very, uh, you need to really go into GitHub to understand what it is, right? Like, so one thing that has really helped out is having an exclusive tool just to place an inner sourcing request. If you know you're going to be working on something, uh, placing an inner sourcing request, something uh, of what is required and kind of linking it to the user story that's actually driving that request gives a little bit more uh, structure and um, transparency into the process, right? If there is a trusted committer who's assigned to a certain inner sourcing request, how much work are they actually uh, doing and how many PRs are they going to be dealing with at any given point in time uh, is something that senior people in the management chain may not have full visibility if you don't have a tool like that. I think uh, we put together a tool like that, which actually helps you track who are the most sorted trusted committers, who are the most uh, often contributing uh, guest committers into the code base. Mm -hmm. So that will help us kind of expose or bring uh, to the surface those people who are quietly contributing to inner source at large, right? And then that can be used to uh, really reward them to recognize them. And also kind of, we have a concept called Bravo for collaboration. So you get a Bravo for collaborating with different teams uh, that gets showcased in your profile on your company web page, right? I think that kind of a closing the loop is, uh, has been really, really working well. and. Um, the mindset change from when we actually introduce a new process, always there is resistance. But now yeah. when people see that, hey, it's not just me being altruistic and allowing somebody to contribute code into my platform, but also my platform is getting richer and richer. And that is actually the responsibility of the guest teams uh, to say, hey, they're not just adding code that benefits my needs or my market needs, but I'm also creating new capabilities for the platform. So tomorrow, if another market comes up with the same request or similar requirement, you can actually turn this on as, as a platform capability and not necessarily uh, specific to a single market, right? I think creating that success stories and celebrating those success stories and rewarding them is absolutely mandatory in this whole process because that's what the formation of a community happens, right? That actually that's is right. the very root of the community formation as well. Yeah, that's that's a fabulous uh, insight there, Satish. How about how about Arthur? Yeah, so I guess for us, maybe um, just one, one more tip. Uh, one thing that we found as we've scaled, and kind of Roderick mentioned, we were <laughs> kind of uh, uh, surprised at the organic growth, and you know, obviously happy with it as well. But uh, one of the challenges with that organic growth is everybody wants a say in the direction of the platform, which makes sense, right? Of course, you want an inner source product uh, to, to satisfy as many people's needs as you need, as you can. Uh, but the question is, how do you add some structure to that process and also allow healthy debate in your inner source community? And we were particularly inspired by uh, some of the well-known RFC processes that exist in the open source communities. So from mm -hmm. Rust Lang and Ember JS to uh, mm -hmm. the Swift programming language. And we kind of mm -hmm. took pieces from that and built our own template that uh, we're finding, obviously, you know, these things take some time to uh, get footing and, and take root, but we're finding a lot of success from having people not only vocalize in a meeting, which, you know, for 
uh, enterprises is usually where decisions get made, but having people write it down, because when you have to think through and write down uh, your idea and what the consequences might be, what the alternatives are that you might have considered, um, that really helps flush out the technical design. And we found that some of the best uh, directions for uh, our platform actually came from uh, healthy RFC discussions. So that's kind of a tip cool. that as your, yeah, as your inner source product grows, consider pulling in these kind of RFC concepts. I would love to see that template donated to inner source commons as a sample. You know, if you can, and if you can um, make mm. it uh, generic enough that it doesn't give anything away, I would love to see that shared. That's a really cool one. Thank right. you very much for that. And you know, Intersource yeah. Commons really is meant to be a growing resource oh. for people that are practitioners of this discipline. So as we're talking about these patterns, I keep thinking, hmm, has that one, have we gotten that one written up yet? So I wanna remind you all that if you go to Intersource Commons Patterns Community, they're actively collecting what we call donuts, which is the beginning of a pattern for future fleshing out. So you don't have to write, spend the time to create the whole pattern to get it in, into consideration. You can just sort of sketch it out for now if that's all you have time for, but it really might help some other people. And you know, hopefully we're all aligned on the idea that if we can succeed in shifting the, the whole industry in this direction, it's gonna benefit engineering generally. It's not about anybody's secret sure. sauce. It's about lifting this, this um, profession that we all, you know, are in the middle of to a new place. So, okay, that was a great round. Do we have enough for round three? Has everybody got one more? As Pretty long as much? you call those donuts Timbits, which is what we call those little <laughs> mini donuts or donut holes for you in the U.S., then I'm happy to contribute. No. <laughs> 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 well, the donut, all of the language around pattern, pattern writing that we practice came out of Bell Labs because uh, when we first, uh, uh. you know, when you start a movement like this, I just stood up on stage one day and said, okay, we're going to talk about this now. And that was because as, nice. you know, 20 years, well, at that point, 18 years of, of advocacy for open source, I felt like we were in danger of not surviving as a movement if we didn't move more of the available engineering resource into being practitioners of this because we've got main maintainer burnout and all the things. And mm. there's a vanishingly mm. small number of people that know how to do this compared to the entirety of engineering. And I feel like those guys sure. are stuck in the salt mines. You know, <laughs> I want to make them free, at least the ones that, that we can get the companies to do that. So, um, so anyway, that's why I started. But I, but I stood up on stage and said, I think we're going to need a pattern language. Because if we don't get a pattern language together, mm -hmm. how are people going to know what mitigations exist? This is so, so situationally specific. And yet there are patterns that emerge that are similar. Isn't this the best way to get that across? And lo and behold, some guys from Bell Labs said, yeah, we can get that started for you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we use the nomenclature that's sort of classic, you know. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, it's been really, really Yeah, I wish, I wish more people knew more about it. Um, this time, let... well, that's why we got to keep I was... doing this, right? For my yeah, opinion, exactly. Considering, considering where we started, it's actually rolling out quite nicely. I didn't want nice. it to happen so quickly that we were going to have to have everything in place already because we're all volunteers. Right. right. I gave it 10 years and we're in year six right now. So we're doing pretty oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I found out right, from it so from, this actually from Roderick. So it's, uh, it, it's one of go. those, you, you look at the patterns and you're like, huh, we kind of self-discovered these. I really wish we had read about this <laughs> <Yes>. before <laughs> the, the and didn't have to learn times. from our own the pattern issues. Guys mm -hmm. are, there's two things about patterns. One is that the pattern people are getting ready to do an ebook that would be the, the collection of patterns that cover uh, most cases that we've already collected. And then nice. secondly, there's now a mind map nice. that was made by say one from um, Comcast that's brilliant for looking at where the patterns mm -hmm. all fit in the larger question of how do we intersource, right? 
but we still have a long way to go to have anything like a complete collection of patterns. So please dive in there if you find it interesting at all. Um, all right, round three, mm -hmm. starting with Satish this time. Um, I'll go take up the trusted committed topic. Um, if I may indulge you in a metaphor that I keep giving people in terms of what inner sourcing means. Um, assume that uh, there's a row of houses on a street and um, I, as a person going and in inner sourcing for a certain customer belonging to a certain market, I need to actually go and modify or alter each house in that row of houses on the street so that when an Indian comes and visits that and stays in that house, it feels Indian to him. When a French person comes and stays, it feels French to them. When a, when a mm -hmm. Canadian comes and stays, it feels Canadian to them. So which means now I need to actually go and take a permission, take approval from each and every house owner to make sure that I'm able to modify their house or experience in a way that is palatable to my customer that I'm serving. At the same time, not breaking anything in their own plumbing or electricity or... Right. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very tricky process altogether. So uh, it means that I need to win the trust of the owner of the house before I can actually go and even start scratching the surface, so to say. And then once I keep doing those changes, then trust builds. And eventually, um, I get a free pass to do what I want. So I become their preferred service person for their house for this market because they don't want to say, I don't want to serve this market. They also want to serve that market. Uh, but before they let me do it, I need to get their trust. So now, as a guest and a host, uh, we need to make sure that there are enough contractual obligations written up. What does it mean to win that trust? What is to become a trusted committer, what are all the things that you need to be doing so that you have proven your worth and ensure that you are capable and you understand what is going on inside my house before you start changing my house. And the second thing that we have found very useful is having component focus group because the it's a lot of times it's tribal knowledge in large and old companies like ours. So how do you bring that tribal knowledge to the surface so wherein even a new person joining in can actually understand more about what's going on inside that component. Uh, the component focus groups have helped where we blend the potential trusted committers of that component and the existing trusted committers of that component come together. They shadow each other and we thereby create a pipeline of trusted committers who can actually become trusted committers for the component, although they don't really own or belong to that component owning team. Uh, this actually creates, again, a sense of community and it's actually uh, broadens the load. Uh, people understand yeah. what is the long-term architecture of the platform. So it actually helps a lot of different ways by forming these component focus groups as well. I think uh, that's a great practice that, that I would like to see if we can uh, kind of create as a pattern and see what does it mean to create such groups. Even for open source community, those kind of patterns do exist. How do you bring those into the company? Uh, is what we are also working on right now. Yeah, I would love to see that pattern written up. That would be fabulous if you could contribute that, Satish. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to go backwards around the circle this time. So, Arthur, you're next. Sure. So, um, maybe one of the, the tips that I'd love to share and or best practices that we found successful uh, as, as we scaled this inner source product, if you're as Roderick said, like if you're in the thick of it, you just have so many requests, both from users for support and from contributors to uh, review and, and get their pull requests merged. Um, as you start to get to that middle stage before you've gone enterprise wide and start to really scale, consider automating the frequent touch points. So what I mean by that, it, for example, when our product started to scale, every time we had to onboard a new user, it required changing a file, updating this nasty reg reg regular expression in Jenkins, um, and, and doing like 30 plus steps, right? Uh, if you really laid them out. Um, right. And, and this, this was okay, you know, when you're starting off, when you're small, but as you really start to grow, you need to automate it. And um, we, we automated it, and it actually eventually grew into a Slack app that people could onboard right from their um, Slack uh, client, right? Uh, so 
look look at the parts that are kind of annoying for you as a maintainer, but also require a lot of effort on your end and create friction between you and the user or you and the contributor and try to automate those away through GitHub apps, um, you know, custom automation, Slack apps, whatever. But that that will really help you scale because ultimately it comes down to how do you, as a human, you, you only have 24 hours in a day, you need right. to sleep, uh, you don't want to get burnt out. So that automation really helps you, um, helps you scale and progress to that next level of growth. That is a great tip. And again, I would love to see a script, a sample script um, donated at, along with the pattern to give people a leg up on that. I think in another five years, all of this stuff will be easy. You know, they'll, they'll, it'll be, they'll, they'll be sample scripts that are written for InterSource the same way that everybody understands Agile now. So there's more available. So, okay, great. Roderick, what you got? Thank you. Yeah, so I'll I'll talk a little bit about a lesson learned that we had that we wish we um, did when we first started because we're you know starting off small you don't really think about some of these details but <laughs> something as simple as like more documentation I think uh, we really lack or we put that as as a back burner <laughs> when we should have put it at the forefront of everything that we did so as we started to grow you know kind of to Satish's point around um, tribal knowledge, right? It, it starts to grow. No one knows how this thing works. Uh, the developer forgot to write the documentation or didn't contribute the documentation along with the code. Um, or it's just not in sync with what actually happens, right? So that like, that's just not a good developer experience. So in order for users to actually want to use your product, you definitely need to document how to use it and, and keep it up to date as the software evolves. And so one of the things that we, we've, we've done is actually have like mobbing sessions or docathons, if you call it, um, if you will, to actually bring folks together, folks who have actually used the product and said, no, this is actually how it works. Yeah. Um, that, and, and you need are, that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, that, so that, you know, your developers know how to, how to interact with the product and, and have a really good experience, so. Yeah, my experience at PayPal was that initially there were a lot of documentation sprints happening, but it was unusable documentation. It wasn't until they had to explain it to somebody else that wasn't part of their team that they started to understand how to talk about it, right? Yeah. And also how to modularize so that the conversation didn't have to be about the whole universe. It could be just about that piece. Yeah, and so, I, will also, I will also add on like a lot of developers document based on how the code is written, right? Sometimes right. you need to step back and have an actual technical writer come in and, and, and describe in simple terms, how does this actually work? Uh, otherwise you have developers who just go directly to the code and start looking through and trying to figure out how it works. And that's not, that's not a good experience either. Yeah, let me say that um, I think that both in open source and in inner source, the need to figure out how to get the actual mentorship accretion to become the documentation is probably the mm. next step for us. And then if it's done properly, you'll be able to tell what's getting the most queries. So they're what is most useful, especially if you get people mm. to rate, did this work for you? So then you can have the tech writer only write up those things instead of everything. Right? Yep. Okay, Matt, you're on. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say I'm really interested in this, uh, teachers, um, the, the concept of the focus groups around the components and the RFC as well. Um, it's, there's something which we're looking at as well is how do we maintain the architectural and, and engineering standards of a complex platform as you invite more contributors in. And it's really, it's, it's a quite a messy problem. And we're looking for ideas of how we can work with this. So I think we may be experimenting with those afterwards. But um, our last practice we'd like to recommend is measure everything. Uh, I'd say yeah. the metrics of which we're gathering out of the system, out of uh, the contributions, and it's obviously there's one side, it's the measuring the data that's going into the system, the, 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 the pull requests, the comments, the issues, all these aspects are, are useful because they're showing that the work is contributing in. But we've probably found the most useful data coming back out has been how often these products are used. 
um, and we mm. may, for instance, if it creates a, a, a binary artifact, then we look at how many times people are accessing that binary artifact, for instance. Um, if we're looking at how many times it's a library, where is that library turning up in GitHub, for instance? We can mm. see all these dependencies in the code, and it's what it's doing is showing the value um, the, there's the value perceived in the product uh, is substantial and that people are using it because they want to use it. There's nothing here which people are made to use. So everything is by choice. And so, um, you know, if they're using the product, then it's useful to them. And again, when you get enough of teams all talking to each other and one team will recommend a product to another team and they start to, you know, word of mouth aspect. But what we found with the metrics is that when they see these products are being used and the numbers are going up, the usage is going up. They had, there's much more confidence for a team to take on that component as part of their, their delivery as well. They're seeing that they know that it's, it's there. Other teams are good that they trust are comfortable with it. And they see that it's been supported and maintained. And that makes it much, much easier to get reuse out of your software. And um, software reuse is a big aspect of what we're doing this year. It's about driving up that, that those metrics around how much do we reuse our components in order to get the value and the, the increase in delivery, of, um, delivery speed for our com of software. That's a great one, Matt. Being able to surface value so that you can sell it up the chain to continue the funding that you need in order to keep, yeah. you know, pushing forward is, uh, is especially for grassroots beginnings, that becomes the way that you get to the place where you get to scale it out. So if you don't have any, if you don't have evidence and you, you mentioned three or four different kinds of really interesting, compelling evidence, then you're going to have a hard time making that sell. So both quantifying and then reporting value back up the chain uh, is, is really the underlying pattern there. And then the how to get to it is the measure everything, which I think is fabulous. It's a really good idea. And I think over time, we will find that, you know, platforms like GitHub and GitLab will start giving us better metrics. Right now, you have mm. to scrape a lot of, the, of what you need. So giving them mm. feedback because this drives sales for them. Nobody goes and gets GitHub Enterprise that isn't expecting the inner source effect. Mm -hmm. And as we know, that Thanks doesn't sure. actually happen for free. And GitHub's not, none of the tools are comp comprehensively what you need yet. So whichever of those three big platforms gets there first or a new one enters in that gets there first, that's going to be very compelling. And they need feedback from practitioners. So, yeah, you know, I, Arthur, yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to touch on that point of people buy GitHub because they expect that inner source effect. I worked yeah. at a previous unnamed company uh, where part of the business said, yes, we want inner source. And the other part said, all repositories are going to be private by default. So try not to do that because they'll kill any inner source. Yeah, yeah. There's lots <laughs> right of away. ways to kill inner source right now. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it still is making, you know, visible inroads in places like banks where people don't do things frivolously. And so that's why we're so excited about getting these financial services panels together for InterSource Summits. And so I really want to thank the, the four of you for contributing to this one. It's, it's I think, going to be a particularly uh, valuable one. So thanks again for putting up with me being sitting in this bizarre situation and all of you from around the world turning up for this. And um, Thank you again so much. Nice. And, um, you know, happy InterSource Day. I hope that you um, have a great time at the event and that I see you around the playground. And please do contribute all of this stuff, at least donuts of this stuff back. Or what were they called? What is that? What's the Timbits. Canadian name of that? Timbits. Donut holes. <laughs> Timbits. <laughs> Thank you. Timbits. <laughs> Oh, you know, interestingly enough, the guy that helped us get our patterns community together is named Tim Yao. So we should totally call those Tim bits. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys. And, um, and we'll see you soon uh, in the playback of this.